everyone, this is Kit Cabello with Hard Lens Media. I'm joined here today with my co-host Eric Unger, and we have an exclusive interview with Dan Cohen. Dan, thank you so much for joining Hard Lens Media. For our viewers and subscribers, can you please introduce yourself and tell us about some of your work that you're going to be doing overseas, and it has to relate to an article that you've recently written as well. Well, thanks a lot for having me, first off. Um, really appreciate the platform, which is you know pretty hard to find when you're challenging the you know, U.S. national security state, you're just totally pushed out of mainstream and it really, you know, falls to indie platforms um, to, you know, and foreign platforms too, um, who, you know, are willing to talk about the, the truths that we're going to discuss. Um, my trip, uh, well, I'm a, I'm a journalist and filmmaker. I was based in Israel, Palestine from 2014 to 2017. Um, I made a documentary called Killing Gaza, along with Max Blumenthal. Um, basically, we went into Gaza and in the 51 day assault and began documenting kind of, um, you know, how people survived or didn't. And then I continued to stay in the aftermath for about a few months, several months out of the next uh, year and a half I spent in the Gaza Strip. And then this became the documentary Killing Gaza, which you can find killinggaza.com, three bucks to rent, five bucks to buy. We made it as cheap as possible so everyone can see it. Um, and then I'm working on a second documentary right now that um, I'm about to travel for, but I'm going to keep that the subject of it a little bit of a secret. But in a few months, um, I, I promise it'll uh, make your eyes pop. <laughs> I'm sure it will. Sounds very good. Um, so, so, Dan, um, so we're here to talk about what's going on in Hong Kong. So my first question for you is what is the class character of the Hong Kong protests? Um, how did it start and whose interest is this protest uh, serving? Right, well, you know, I think it's really important to look at kind of um, the economic condition, socioeconomic condition of Hong Kong, um, where, you know, it went from being the financial capital of China um, you know, where there was uh, also a strong manufacturing base and people could have, you know, a good life there and there was a lot of wealth. Um, and since, um, you know, in the last basically decade or so, it's um, the labor has gone overseas, or I'm sorry, over into mainland China, um, you know, as labor often does, like we've seen in the US um, with neoliberalism where factories, you know, around the United States, the manufacturing base has been wiped out. Well, there's a similar phenomenon in Hong Kong um, and so um, now young people who are coming out of, uh, you know, college um, don't really have much of a bright future. And that's, again, that's a parallel that a lot of young people in the U.S. can relate with, uh, relate to. It's basically a service industry. Um, the biggest industries in Hong Kong are finance and real estate. Um, and so, uh, you know, if you're a young person coming out of school, you know, you can, what, like in the U.S., you can drive Uber or something like that, and and be saddled with student debt. Right. Um, and and so there's a lot of frustration, rightfully so, um, in Hong Kong, especially with young people. But what's happening is you have um, uh, an oligarch named Jimmy Lai, who is um, the owner of the largest media empire in Hong Kong. He's kind of like the Rupert Murdoch of Hong Kong. He is a very right wing. Um, and he's pumping up these protests, which oftentimes turn into riots, saying, go out and demonstrate in the streets against uh, you know, this Chinese communist dictatorship. Um, and at the same time, he's actually making huge amounts of money um, by covering this. So not only is there an ideological reason, but there's a major financial incentive for Jimmy Lai also. Um, and earlier this summer, Lai traveled to Washington to meet with the most hawkish members of the Trump administration. He met with Mike Pence, uh, Mike Pompeo, and with um, now the former, hallelujah, yes. praise the Lord, yes. former National Security Thank Advisor God. John Bolton. Um, <laughs> you know, and I wanna take this opportunity to declare, um, you know, this, well, well, I guess today is what, now September 13th, 12th. 12th. Um, did he get he he can he can John Bolton on 9/11 didn't he or was that no that was the 10th the 9th it was the day before yeah. so it was like a yeah. pre right. uh, pre 9/11 okay. gift i guess so i, yeah. I feel like 9/10 i want to declare it a national holiday in the united states for John Most Bolton's definitely. firing 
I have to agree um, with that. Most definitely. So, so Jimmy Lai, you know, is if you listen to what he says, he appeared at the foundation of defensive democracies and neocon, you know, one of the most influential neoconservative think tanks. He talks in this clash of civilizations uh, narrative about Hong Kong, like, oh, we're with you against uh, the Chinese who they don't have any values. And the irony is Jimmy Lai, he is from mainland China. Mm -hmm. um, and he came over as a kid to Hong Kong and made his fortune in the garment industry. And then eventually he transitioned um, into media. But so he hates, he, he vehemently hates Chinese mainlanders and he's a mainlander originally himself. In his media outlets, you can find these like uh, xenophobic right-wing tropes calling Chinese mainlanders locusts, um, you know, like they're insects invading. And it kind of, you know, corresponds to the trope, you know, we hear in the US about like anchor babies and Mexicans coming to take our jobs and our resources and this kind of thing. Um, when instead of actually blaming the oligarchs, you know, the billionaires who um, destroyed the economy um, so they could get more profit, um, you know, it, it, they, they point the finger at the scapegoats. And so you mentioned the class character, um, you know, a lot of it is middle upper class, upper class people who are taking their uh, rage out against, not against, you know, wealthy people. Like they don't go to, for instance, the house of, uh, the chief executive of Hong Kong, Carrie Lam, who, th who they really hate, or like to the wealthiest areas, um, Victoria Peak, where, you know, if you go to Hong Kong, it's this incredible view um, and from, from uh, Victoria Peak. Um, instead, they're like shutting down the metro uh, system, which, you know, regular people rely on to get to work. So the idea is to kind of shut down the economy, even cause a recession, um, in order to, you know, punish Hong Kong. And it's very much plays into, uh, you know, this whole Cold War, new Cold War with China, um, which Trump's trade war is kind of the beginning of. Right. All right. Um, so another thing that we, we see a lot uh, at these demonstrations are, you know, the imperialist uh, flag of the United States and the previous... Um, colonial flag of uh, Britain, the Union Jack. So, uh, and, and also Pepe the Frog. So why do you think those symbols are being raised there? Well, um, you know, the National Endowment for Democracy, which is the United States government's regime change arm, you know, its biggest regime change arm that was formed in the 1980s um, after basically the CIA's reputation of bloody coups uh, was so bad that the Reagan administration basically decided, well, you know, we need a different way to do this. So instead of, you know, these covert coups and this kind of thing and, uh, and just directly murdering people, we're going to make it um, appear as like this popular uh, revolt. And so the, the National Endowment for Democracy and its subsidiaries, the International Republican Institute and the National Democratic Institute and Freedom House all start pouring money into various uh, like targets of the US empire, Hong Kong being one of them. Um, and, so, um, in, and, and so they kind of shape how the message is. You know, I would compare it to like, if you have a sailboat, then you know, the masses of protesters are kind of like the, you know, the wind in the sail, they're providing like the real force, but under the water, you have the rudder, which is guiding the overall direction of the boat. And this is where the National Endowment for Democracy mm -hmm. um, and the U.S. consulate come in. And so last week, we saw this massive protest um, featuring, as you said, American flags and the, and, and the Union Jack. And, you know, for we've seen these before, these American flags, people singing the Star Spangled Banner, right. which is this really bizarre sight, people holding up huge signs that say, President Trump, liberate us. Yeah. I mean, it's really bizarre. It's um, totally backwards. Yeah, yeah but um, you know, on last week when there was a huge demonstration outside the uh, U.S. consulate in Hong Kong, it was like, I mean, the videos I saw, I wasn't there, but it looked like tens of thousands of people all cheering wildly as a long line of like masked protesters carrying massive, enormous Amer American flags 
you know, split the crowd like Moses through the Red Sea, just right. parted it, and they and everyone is just cheering wildly. And so it's like, you know, a lot of people say, well, you know, that that contingent, that you know, pro-US contingent is very small. You know, there's a lot of leftists. And I'm like, well, I see these videos and I just see overwhelming support for the US. And instead of um, addressing, you know, this protest, addressing um, you know, Hong Kong's government or the Chinese government, it was actually addressing the US Congress and specifically calling on Congress to pass the Hong Kong Democracy and Human Rights Bill, um, which has a you know a nice fluffy name, but this is um, from Marco Rubio, you know the noted leftist, um, and, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, you know if you know anything about Marco Rubio, I mean there's not like a you know he's, he's a just, total commie, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, a real hippie, yeah. Um, you know, I mean Marco Rubio's. Rep, you know, a, a, a resume speaks for itself, backing you know every right wing coup possible in Latin America, and he's just he's he never just met like a coup the, he didn't like. Exactly, and right. so they're calling on you know Congress to pass Marco Rubio's bill, which you know has broad bipartisan support because the Cold War with China has bipartisan support. It's not just a Trump thing. Um, you know, a lot of like the Democratic Party elite. Um, has you know cheered this on, and not only the Democratic Party elite, but even the kind of insurgent wing of the Democratic Democratic Party, like Ilhan Omar, which is I was so disappointed to see that she's like, oh, I stand in solidarity with these protesters, while they're you know saying like, I mean, it's like a MAGA protest yeah. where like in the U.S., you know, I mean, the left de- denounces them as like, you know, these people are fascists, they're white supremacists, these people are Nazis, and you know, some t- I mean fine but why are we going to cheer that on in hong kong Mm -hmm. and so when you look at what this uh bill actually is it basically um calls for sanctions on hong kong it it's it every year the state department uh has to um address the um how autonomous hong kong is and if it's not sufficiently autonomous for the u.s's taste meaning if it's you know if it's acting as kind of part of China, which it is um, part of China, Hong Kong is by definition part of China, then um, then the U.S. will sanction Hong Kong, uh, you know, cut down the business ties um, and sanction individuals. And so I don't, you know, how does that help Hong Kong? How does that promote freedom or human rights or democracy? It right. doesn't. All it does is kind of, it's like cutting off the nose to spite the face. It kind of punishes Hong Kong in order to punish China. And that's what it's really about. And it's going to be, and it, all it does is serve the, serve the interests of uh, American oligarchs and oligarchs in Hong Kong who are tied to the West. And, you know, frankly, it's it's kind of a losing battle. I mean, it's like, imagine if China was, like demanding that, you know, was saying that, uh, uh, you know, California is an autonomous region um, and, you know, of the United States and we're supporting this like separatist movement. They're supporting the separatist movement in California. And it's like, well, this is part of the United States. So, you know, it would be obviously denounced as meddling, as, you know, as Chinese malign influence in the United States. Mm -hmm. But when the United States does it in China, then it's, this is democracy. It's a pro-democracy right? movement. Yeah. So, so then essentially, when we look at you, because you, you explained in detail a little bit about the economic situation in Hong Kong, but then let's look at a larger picture in regards towards the Hong Kong government, because at some point there had to be a shift where eventually some of the policies that they were implementing were going up against working class citizens. So, uh, what, were, what were the previous Hong Kong administration uh, policies towards working class citizens, and how did it get to this breaking point to where there is this backlash towards not only the, the government? Hong Kong, but towards Beijing, what what were some of the initial policies that really led to this start? Because of course there are some protesters there that are legitimately you know against Beijing and against corruption in Hong Kong, but I guess it seems to be you know, being taken over by other groups outside of China. Right, they're being subsumed by by the kind of you know bigger interests at play. Right. Um, you know, I think when you look at you know how Hong Kong's economic decline. Um, you know, is really important to see how, um, you know, it's gone from, from having this manufacturing base that has gone 
overseas, over to mainland China, um, which is really the fault of oligarchs, of billionaires who are interested in their own in their own profit, and they have, you know, no allegiance to the U.S. They have no allegiance to China. They're just purely, um, you know, in- self-interested in their own in their own profit motives, and so. Um, you know the the trigger for these this current round of protests um, was uh, an extradition bill. Basically, what happened is uh, this guy and his girlfriend went from Hong Kong, went to Taiwan on vacation, and he found out that she was pregnant by another man, and so he murdered her, cut her up, mm. de- dismembered her, put her body in a suitcase, and threw her in the bushes. And then left, flew back to Hong Kong, took her her credit cards, her ATM cards, and went and withdrew money. And so, because there's no extradition treaty between Hong Kong, Taiwan, and mainland, um, he couldn't be prosecuted for this grisly murder. And so, when Hong Kong proposed this, then you saw this mass mobilization that continues today. Um, and even after, you know, Carrie Lam, the chief executive of Hong Kong. Um, suspended the uh, the bill that you know would would have this extradition treaty. The protests continue, so it suggests. I mean, it's totally clear that the protests are actually about something else. Um, and at first, a lot of the billionaires, a lot of the oligarchs in Hong Kong supported the protests because you know it kind of serves as like it's like the, where like offshore accounts um, are in Hong Kong. There's like these offshore accounts, so you know, kind of like. Um, how you know we have like i don't know what like the bahamas in the u.s where like if you have some dirty money or whatever you just keep it there and it's not taxed or whatever it is that's how hong kong works um for for a lot of people so the billionaires didn't want this extradition treaty um because of financial crimes they could be punished for in beijing in china in mainland china but then once it was withdrawn the, the treaty, the bill was withdrawn. Then the billionaires are like, okay, enough of these protests. This is like hurting my business. This is shutting down the economy. Right. But the protests have still gone on. So um, they're losing popularity. Um, and, you know, it's not, it's not a defense of Hong Kong's, you know, government. Um, it's just that like there needs to be a better answer than, you know, having Hong Kong and this, the disaffected youth as like the cannon fodder for you know washington's cold war with china absolutely uh and you know first again we want to really thank you so much for joining us and i think eric you got one more question to ask yeah um yeah so as we wrap up uh this uh this interview i'm sure we can continue this uh again among other topics uh where can our viewers and subscribers learn more about learn more about you and where can people find your work uh, you can just check out my website, dancohenmedia.com. Um, watch my documentaries. I mentioned before, Killing Gaza. Just Google Killing Gaza, killinggaza.com. And follow me on Twitter where I'm very active, um, at dancohen3000. And uh, just keep up w- with me there. Hit me up. And, uh, yeah, that's that's where I'm at. All right. Well, we want to personally invite you back on the show. I mean, this definitely requires a follow-up. We're looking forward to seeing more of your work. Uh, otherwise, uh, Dan, thank you again for joining Heartlands Media. And should you be in the city of Chicago, we invite you to be in our studio as well. Peace and take care. Most definitely. Thanks a lot, guys.